for today. We can just start with the updates uh, and then come back to our presentation as soon as our speaker joins us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Geshi Karuri Sabina. For those of you who I owe email responses, I promise to do so after this uh, lunch box. Um, I'm just seeing some names there. Um, it's really exciting to have this, our first lunch box of the year. Uh, one of the things we were very proud of uh, from 2023 is that in spite of many other challenges, as we also managed to keep our seminars going, uh, for us it's a very important opportunity just for keeping uh, uh, touch with each other, uh, having an ear out on interesting scholarship that's coming up. Some of you might need the motivation because you're doing your own writings or your own PhDs and masters. Um, but there's always uh, interesting methods, interesting topics that others are studying. Uh, if you are doing interesting work that you'd like to share on this platform, we welcome you to reach out to Zibusiso because we think this is the place to do it. Uh, if you want to get early feedback or just disseminate some of what you're thinking about, uh, this should hopefully be a good uh, space for that. Uh, we've got a nice number of you online and some in the room. Uh, I hope everybody feels welcome. Uh, we don't normally do a round of introductions, but when we come later to Q&A after the presentations, of course, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Uh, and for those of you who are online, uh, um, uh, you're also welcome to say a bit more about yourself on the chat because you have that freedom. Um, today's Lunchbox series will be by uh, Dr. Chikane, who is one of our managers at the Tyresha Center. Um, I think all of you hopefully by now know a little bit about the Tyresha Center or research group as they are called. Uh, we try to focus on issues of digital governance. We've been going for just over a year. And uh, just to give some updates, uh, we recently did a review. We're quite proud of quite a lot of the things we managed to do last year. Uh, some of them that are actually leading us into this year by way of updates are we've got three book projects that are going. Um, uh, those in the room can see the posters at the back, which were the output of our working paper series uh, in partnership with the Hans Seidel Foundation, which was on Africa's digital transformation and its governance. Uh, and uh, a subset of those papers, as well as some additional papers, are factoring into a new book project, also in partnership with the Hans Seidel Foundation, that will be titled, what is the title, man? Where's Hudson when I need him? Um, it's something to do with digital governance, but basically to do with the politics of it, uh, and I think the relations between the state and other actors. Uh, so that's a book that should be coming out later this year. Uh, a second book that a few of us here are working on uh, is um, uh, uh, sponsored by our faculty, the Commerce Law and Management Faculty, uh, which is a book, uh, uh, a bit of a reader, if you want, uh, on digital governance in Africa. Uh, and so that will be a second book uh, coming out, uh, published by Africa Minds and um, what, what was this year's fault? Leuven, Leuven Press. Um, and then a third book, uh, which again some of you are involved with here, uh, is uh, with Paul Grave uh, on uh, essentially, I think it's something with public administration, uh, AI and governance, something like that. Um, and so that's a third book. So it's quite a lot that's happening uh, in the way, you know, in that sense of, of output. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about any of those, please let us know. But we'll also keep you posted, as we always do, as new publishing and sharing opportunities uh, come up. Welcome, Dr. Chikane. Um, we uh, also have, um, uh, in, in process, we began last year through a partnership with Digital African, um, uh, an outreach effort. In addition to this more academic publishing, we've also been trying to put out more popular material. And so last year, you might have picked up a few op-eds in, the, in uh, the Mail and Guardian and I think the Daily Maverick. Um, and so that's something that Natsil, uh, Dr. Dr. Masaka here is helping us with and we'll be hoping to do more of that. I think we're going into an election series um, that should be coming out over the next couple of months. Uh, so some of the presentations we've had here that have had to do with this topic of elections and e-voting and a few other things, including Maxwell's own research uh, uh, and some other pieces will be factoring into that over the next few weeks. Uh, and then I believe with our new research assistant, Oni, we're also looking at beyond that what the next series of articles become. So for those of you who are doing work that's looking for a popular placement and popular communication, um, that's becoming an important platform for us. Um, and we would encourage you also to get in touch with us if you're interested. Big for us this year are a number of big events. We are hosting the UN uh, ICEGOV conference in October. Uh, I hope all of you would have received, if you're on our mailing list, the call for papers and the call for workshops on that. Please do look at that. It's a very important uh, opportunity for us, I think, for those who want to communicate their academic work or their advocacy work. 
uh, into the African and international space. Uh, so we're anticipating two to 300 people from around the world gathering at the CSIR ICC uh, to talk about um, their 10 different themes. So I'm sure there's something that touches on your digital governance interest. Please look at that, certainly register to attend, if not to present or participate. Uh, I thought it might be nice because we've got a good crowd from CPIN today that one of the projects they run with other digital dialogues, and maybe we can just mention what's happening on that front for those who are interested. Yes, then? Uh, CTA in partnership with the International Civil Society Center, they're based in Germany. We can host a monthly webinar series that, that happens the first Thursday of every month. And um, just to reflect on the last topic, so on the 1st of February, the topic was we have the right to we have the right to fight electronic waste, and the next debate will take place on the seventh of March from five to six. South African Standard Time. And if you'd like to learn more about the digital dialogues, please go to our social media. So that's either CTIM or the ICSC um, on LinkedIn. And what's the dialogue on the 7th? Uh, the dialogue on the 7th is also going to be technology and elections. And then we'll be discussing it from a global perspective okay. issues that affect both the global north and the global south. So no. look forward to that. Next month. Yes. Uh, if you don't know the CTIN, that's the Civic Tech Innovation Network, and you can find it at civictech.africa. Civic Great, thank you very much for that. I think maybe that's enough by way of update. Uh, if you aren't on our newsletter and you're not receiving information about what's going on, uh, please blame Zivu and follow up with him. I'm sure he'll be glad to share more information. Uh, CTIN also has a mailing list, which you are welcome to join. Are you good to go? No. Okay, excellent. So we've got in the room with us Dr. Rehusbetsa Chikane. Uh, really glad to have you offering, in fact, in <laughs> that you should present today. <laughs> uh, Love volunteers. Yeah. Um, and so for those of you who don't know him, Dr. Chikane is a lecturer with our VIT School of Governance. So he's our homie here, including at the Tyresha Center. Uh, but you may also know him from some of his more popular work as a political commentator, as an activist, and as an author. Uh, he was also instrumental behind the Fees Must Fall. <laughs> Why is lifetime ago now? Yeah. <laughs> it's been forever. Uh, had a background in public policy uh, as well as uh, his PhD work, which was on decoloniality, development, and complexity economics. He is associated with Wiser here at WITS, for those of you who know that group, and of course with our center, um, and has broad research focus areas on decolonial thought development, youth politics, complexity, and South African public policy. He is a Mandela Road Scholar, an Obama Fellow, a Mandela Washington Fellow, a Shevening Scholar. Uh, so he's quite a lot of things, but he, most importantly, Mail and Guardian felt he was somebody to watch. Top 200 young people. I don't, how young are you now? <laughs> oh, we've done what we amazing my year. We will do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Chikane. We're looking forward to your presentation. Our topic today is reimagining public policy in the African state through digital transformation. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Please prepare your questions, your compliments, and your feeling arrows. <laughs> um, so let me just share the screen, and hopefully they can hear me as well. So I must apologize, I had a doctor's appointment that just like ran longer than expected. Um, so those who are online cannot see me dripping in sweat. So I don't need to apologize to you, but for those sitting around me, I apologize profusely. Um, so this topic, if for those who don't know, I'm pretty sure it would have been discussed in one way or another, if this is full screen, there we go. There you go. Um, so for those who don't know, um, obviously the center is producing a book with uh, the Hans Seidel Foundation. Um, Half done is editing this book. Um, and we got, this was an evolution of our working paper series. And Half done then asked me to write a chapter around public policy and governance and digital transformation. I was like, well, there's too many things, <laughs> right? All in one, like you can deal with one at a time. Um, and originally I had like a co-author, but like for various different reasons, I had to like work on it by myself. Um, so I decided to like play around with this chapter with new ideas I've been kind of banding about. 
Um, for those who know, I do a lot of digital governance is like my pay the bills research, if that makes sense. Like I'm really passionate about it and it's what people really like. And I like how it, it opens up new avenues of development. But I think the governance and the public policy of it has particular challenges. And a lot of them I'm going to talk about today. Um, so take this as the paper's not finished <laughs> in any particular way. Uh, I'm going to tell you where the data is coming from that I'll be looking at in particular. It's about 14 different countries, essentially, or kind of documentary analysis, but we will get there. So bear with me. This is also a working title. All my titles are like an inside joke to myself. I always put the word reimagining in whatever title I have, because it just gets me in the mode of like thinking that we I mean, just think differently. So it probably won't be reimagining. I don't know what it will be, but just bear with me on that. Um, so when I thought about writing this paper, I had like three, a couple of concerns, like seven concerns, right? So one of them is there's generally like a lack of planning for what the governance of digital transformation is. This is very different from like the planning of interventions, right? And it really speaks to the heart about the difference between governance and public policy, where public policy is the activities that people do, whereas governance is managing the decisions that maximize public good right, or that creates public good in one way or another. So when you look at um, the developmental plans by African states when they're thinking about digital transformation, it's almost exclusively focused on what are the public policy interventions we can have, but not necessarily what is the governance framework that we're utilizing here, right, homegrown ones, and you'll see why that's important a bit later. Right, and the other one is about improving activities, so improving like the efficiencies of government. Right? It's not necessarily about improving the outcomes of government, because improving the outcomes of government is a governance question in of itself. Right? So it's really about like the, you don't, it's almost like we really care about how the meat is grinded. Like we really want to know how we can grind this meat as best as possible. What we do with that meat afterwards is neither here nor there. Is it nutritional? Is it good? And that's the way that I kind of do this. It's one of the concerns I've had with the field over the last few years. Um, the other one is the kind of focus on this idea that if you simply connect people and you give people digital skills and literacy, the world will simply become a better place. That might be true, but the equation, the causal connection between these two things, we've now seen enough evidence to show us that it's not necessarily the case. ICT development within developing countries is not a magic bullet that changes things. Right? This is quite well established. The other one is that, and it kind of links to the last point, it's really unclear what the costs and benefits of digital transformation and whether they've met, so that should be political expectations. So the promises of ICT, have they actually manufactured it one, but leapfrogging, that African countries can leapfrog simply by connecting? Have we seen that? Have we seen that take place in the continent? How long does it take? I've got a bit of a timeline. I'm gonna go through these last few ones quickly. Um, this next point you won't get until we get to the next slide, but we're approaching what uh, Colota Perez describes as like a turning point, and you'll know what I'm talking about just now, but there's no clear understanding about what people do in that turning point as an African state, but there's no general consensus, and I'll show you why I think that's quite important, and then there's a real big tendency for everyone to follow the same kind of trajectory. Um, everyone has, it might seem like there's lots of different models for digital transformation, but when you step back, you start realizing that all of them are essentially the same, generally speaking. And then this is the last one, which is a bit more controversial. I'm not sure if I fully believe in this concern, but it's the idea that there's just a real lack of discussion about like what the global South is doing when it comes to the governance of innovation, development, and growth when it comes to digital technologies, right? There's a very clear idea about what is happening in Europe, right, around privacy, right, that that's quite central, about public interest, that's quite central. In the United States, it's less about privacy, and I'm gonna talk about that just now, it's more about kind of like financial access free markets, right? There's these different clear ideological ideas about what governance of these things look like when it comes to ICT development, but you don't necessarily see that in the continent. And I borrow that um, from a guy from ODI called David Eaves. 
uh, using a presentation that really kind of solidified that point. So the general problem that we're facing as a continent is that we are trying to develop ICT technologies when the world is now slowly outpacing us, <laughs> essentially. But that we are still thinking in the idea of simply connecting people when the world is now thinking about platform governance, essentially, and what the future of platform governance essentially looks like. And that's really the importance of that is that traditional ways of thinking about ICT are really supply side dependent. What can government kind of offer you? Demand side is how do you manage the demand for government services at scale? And how do you allow other people to create government services on your behalf? This is not public procurement. It's just a different way about thinking about the state. Right? And the current models of digitalization inherently build upon the notion of joint up or whole of government. So the way we go about digital transformation is eerily similar to the evolution of governance over the last like 60 years from the traditional to market led to bring everyone together <laughs> to network governance and eventually what we call computational governance, but I'll talk about that just now. And the general points that I try highlighting in the paper is that when we think about models, why those two points generally happen, which is the second point, is for two reasons. One is all our models around digital transformation that really have been banding about in different ways all follow the exact same steps. They use different terminology and different wording, maybe slightly different logic, but it's really about put information out there, make people interact with the state online, right? And then some sort of third engagement, whether it's e-democracy or citizen-centric government services. But all of them follow that, and I'll, I'll show you where I got that from. And then along this path, governments naturally shift debates from equality of process towards equality of outcomes. So this is not a old debate. This is like an old Bavarian notion of do you ensure that everyone goes through the exact same experience of government? Or do you say everyone doesn't have to go through the exact same experience of government, but everyone should get the same outcome? Um, if that doesn't make sense for those who've ever gotten a passport, the idea that some people must go to home affairs and deal with the bureaucracy of home affairs to get a passport vis-a-vis -vis some people who can simply go to the bank in a much more efficient task, right? The outcome is the same. Everyone gets the same passport, but the process is different. And the discussion here when people talk about digital inclusion often deals with this dynamic of, can you have digital inclusion if there's no equality of process as well? Are you allowed to leave people behind? So it puts everyone on like the same kind of path because the continent is essentially in the same type of space. And obviously that leads to um, notions of when we talk about joint up government, co-production, co-creation, co-participation. Right. And because everyone follows this particular approach, it then forces everyone, at least in my mind, this is what I want to find out, to essentially create digit national ICT strategies that almost become solely looking for operational efficiency. Not necessarily like, can we rethink the functioning of the state? Right. Because to do that means you need to rethink what governance looks like. To rethink what governance looks like essentially implies we're rethinking what public value is in society, right? How we organize public value, how we um, achieve it. Right, so I borrow from the work of Kolota. I know I always say if I say wrong, I've kind of been using this framework as like my own shorthand, but she developed this, what, 2000, 2003, yeah. Um, where she talks about how technologies, um, and this is really from how technologies are financed by the private sector first. It creates this rapid increase, so you get a big bang of a new technology, and that is because smaller bits of technology all combine to create something that is hugely productive for certain sectors. Um, her classic example is like the railroad, and the entire notion of the railroad was particular technologies coming together that allow people to create railroads at scale, and that boosts the Industrial Revolution, if that makes sense. So she tracks this over time. She applies the same kind of logic to technology. And this is the idea that there's some sort of big bang that happens. There's a frenzy by private markets. So you say, say, how do we fund this? How do we do this? How do we scale this up? And because there's huge influx of money into the sector, there's an eventual crash in that sector, a bubble bursts. Right? Our most recent example is 
all these, what do they call them? Like the Ubers and the Airbnbs and that particular, there was a boom of platform companies in the early 2000s that is now kind of busted. So WeWork is a nice example of that, right? So we, you can see this example kind of forming out. And once that happens, government then intervenes. So that turning point is a collapse and government intervenes and essentially turns financial capital into production capital and then the sector matures and then a new technology comes in. You go on and on and on and on. My question then becomes, if you apply this logic to governor of government and ICT development, the rapid desire to connect people, right? Who's leading the charge there? If you had to place countries on this kind of framework, what would that look like? And most importantly, what would the turning points look like? What happens when it comes to digital innovations that are skyrocketing? Skyrocketing is not the right word, but I'll use it. Right. And when that turning point happens, who gets to decide what synergies are created? Right. I also use two other theoretical framings. One is two of them are quite simple. One is, like I said before, that governance is simply managing the decisions related to producing the public good. Generally speaking, there's many different definitions of it. That's the one I like the most. Um, it's like my own one. It's my shorthand and it helps me move through the world. And then public policy, I just divide public policy into two particular things, policy instruments and organizations that administer instruments. Right? This is quite important to distinguish between the two of them. So I'll ask myself a few questions, um, as one must do at times. Um, and these kind of guide this. I'm pretty sure one of them will change because I've started like crunching some of the data. And then I don't know if that question makes sense anymore. Um, it poses a new and interesting question, but we'll see. But essentially, are African states at this gestation, installation, turning point, synergy, or maturity? So if we go back here, at what point, if you look at that bottom on the x-axis, where are we as a continent or particular countries? Gestation, are we reaching the big bang? Are we in a state of frenzy just before the collapse and the turning point? Have we reached synergies? I'm trying to map where digital ICT strategies are. Right. And then this is a really ridiculous word, but I love using it. The African ICT strategies display forms of mimetic isomorphism. Right. And essentially it's a fancy word of people copy each other, really, at the end of the day. That institutions tend to copy each other. Right. And do they do this regarding ICT development when it comes to both public policy and governance? And this is how I started bringing both of these things together in one paper. And as a sub question to that, do African ICT strategies seek to replicate the evolution of governance from the traditional model to NPM to joint up governments, as we have seen elsewhere in the world outside of a few examples, or elsewhere in the Western world, let me say that, outside of a few examples. And then the real big one is, is the turning point limiting the state's ability to govern? So why I like this question is, I always think about the Poppy Act in South Africa and how it looks so similar to the GDPR, right? And the GDPR was created because there was a turning point in Europe around what, how do we protect citizens' data, right? How do we protect this? How do we create like a firm framework because there's now an abuse of data? So the question then becomes, are we similar simply because, you know, we have the exact same problems? We have the exact same challenges. Are we similar because we use their turning point crisis to inform our own policies? And is that a good or bad thing? I really don't know, but it's a question that I like kind of asking about when turning points happen and states get control of innovations that are happening in society or try and regulate those innovations, are those turning points universally applicable to everyone? So, oh, I didn't put the date yet, but in general, and Vice wrote like this really nice paper about um, digital transformation in Kenya. So I think it was 2018. I don't know why I didn't put the date, but they, they kind of highlight certain points that I use as a, as a point of departure when thinking about digital transformation and the way public officials think about them. So, one is it's inevitable, it will happen, right? People are generally uncertain about the outcomes, but we know we have to do it, generally speaking. Um, there's an ascendancy of the digital age. There's this latent power in digital technologies that can change society in one way or another. 
um, both internally and externally. And that last point I always find interesting, that digital technology, often people forget this, but digital technologies are essentially like act agnostic. They don't really care who utilizes it. The only time they become interesting is how actors negotiate their own usages of these technologies. And the technology is agnostic. It's neither here nor there. It is what it is. How people utilize and who gets to utilize it, citizen, the state, private sector, etc. That really becomes an interesting aspect to look into. So started so doing the readings and writings and looking at different things. So I borrowed this from two particular authors who did the work of tracing all these models. And what you're seeing on the screen now, since 2000 to about 2022, the first four were found by someone else, the next five were someone else, and the last three is essentially like me, that these models all talk about what are the stages of transformation that the state goes through. When we talk about digital transformation, what from having no connectivity to being a platform government? Like what are the stages that governments generally want to follow, right? And you can see these different terminology generally across the board, right? You'll see web presence every now and again, you'll see transacting, you'll see information, but all of them essentially argue the same point, right? All of them kind of follow this model, right? That the first and foremost is you provide people with information. Almost every single one of these steps from web presence, billboard, information dissemination, go all the way down to the last five, presenting, digitalization, publishing, all of that generally speak to create a website, really, <laughs> at the end of the day. We're going to create a government website so that people can talk to us or we can have one-way forms of communication. We tell them this is what's happening. This next stage, right, so the first one is just information. The next one is transaction. Essentially, it is now a two-way relationship. I've created a website. Citizens can now engage with this website in one form or another. Right, I can transact with the state, whether this is paying bills, whether it's getting information about um, services, whether it's actual digital services, right? And then you get the engagement approach, which is essentially how you create a government that is citizen-centric. Pretty much all of these frameworks at some point or another will talk about having some of that very last line of being a lot more citizen-centric about what your tools and technologies are supposed to do. So when I look at this, it's like, well, the literature is telling us, well, everyone follows this model. We might have different terminology for it, but the literature is generally pushing us in this direction. So then I ask the question of, well, and this is what I want to start testing out. But then I ask the question is, well, then is everyone copying each other, generally speaking, on the continent? Right? If we're all following like from the same hymn book, are we then necessarily singing the same song? So I ask the question of, is there mimetic isomorphism, so is everyone copying each other, right, across policy instruments? So I'll probably not do this for this chapter and probably leave it for another paper because I think it's really, really interesting. But if you break down policy instruments, so this is Margaret Stanley from 2007, like their seminal paper around e governance in the digital age, something like that. And they borrowed this from good old fashioned Christopher Hood. Um, Break down policy instruments, right, into four particular areas, modality, authority, treasure, organization. Generally speaking, the actual instruments of the state fall into these categories, right, whether it's provision of information, data publication, entitlements, subsidies, grants, taxes, right? You can generally organize policy instruments. When you hear a government saying you've created an e-government platform and we've uploaded 260 whatever whatever services onto this platform for people to access or they might come and be like i thought i read an article of mongolia like we put 16,000 services onto i said 16,000 for 4 million people doesn't the math doesn't math right but generally what they're talking about is that they digitize many of these types of services across multiple different industries i mean levels of government onto one platform generally that's what they're talking about so the question then becomes, well, do they look all the same? Well, the obvious answer is yes. Generally speaking, they will all look the same because taxes are taxes regardless of where you go. It might change the mode of how you're taxing, but the tax, the concept of a tax doesn't change, right? Uh, the concept of an ID document can change, but generally doesn't change, right? 
So I make this argument of like, you know, generally when it comes to public policy, and I'm unsure about organizations administering instruments, I'm not sure about that yet, but generally speaking, people copy each other because there's really one template to go about these things right now, All right? And what I'm going to do in the paper is I'm also going to show how it alters policy cycles in particular. So I thought about doing this in the paper now. I probably don't have enough words, but what I'll end up doing is showing how digital technologies can also not copy <laughs> and alter public policy processes. So for those who see in Haftan lecture or me lecture, both of us, we can never agree about like who used the slide first. I'm pretty sure he stole it from me, but it is what it is. Um, but generally speaking, this is how policy is created. An original idea of the paper was to highlight how digital transformation has altered this process, but using African kind of case studies, right? So how agenda setting has been fundamentally changed. And I think that is kind of like a balancing aspect of a certain services that stay all the same, and there's certain things that are very different. So agenda setting is in certain places, um, government knows about an issue because Twitter says this is an issue. You know what I mean? Like the public discourse is there. In certain countries, Twitter means absolutely nothing. You're not setting the agenda that way in any particular way, but you're using other digital platforms to influence the state, right? Policy discussions, policy formulation. Generally, we look at the traditional cycle as quite linear um, and a bit reiterative. This is the new kind of cycle that digital technology has no start or end point when it comes to the formulation of policy. You could have someone legitimately think about an idea now that becomes very, very popular on Twitter or on a social media platform that government then speeds through this entire process and gets it into the implementation phase. Like the speed of information has made this a lot more rampant to the point where there's no clear understanding of where the start and end point of policies are. And that is probably a bad way to think about it. There are better ways that to continuously evaluate whatever that you're doing, right? And I kind of highlight different examples of that. Um, I won't, this is like a slide I use in class usually, just thought I would put it here, about how this has happened across the world, right? So does anyone here have Instagram? I'm gonna gamble here, right? And if you do have Instagram and you're fairly young, do you follow the shade room? Anyone follow the shade room? Anyone heard of the shade room before, right? Shade room overnight puts Heat Magazine almost out of business, right? Because it's essentially Heat Magazine, but on your phone. And the economies of scale there were minuscule. They had a staff of 12 people, but were reaching more readership than Heat Magazine that's across the world, <laughs> right? Like the, the impact to set the agenda is prevalent using social media. I just like using the shade. And whether it's Donald Trump, you can find other ones when it comes to policy formulation. The classic one is the Google flu paradox. Leading up on that is really fun. But for me, I wanted to know like what are the interesting examples of that in the African continent? Whether I have the time to do that is a whole other conversation. So I deal with like that public policy element of for the chapter, I talk about mimetic isomorphism. What are the things that generally always stay the same? And then I use a policy cycle to then show what are the things where we are different, right? And is that useful to know? I'm not entirely sure. And then I move into governance and I think I've got like five minutes. Then I go into governance and ask the question, well, do we follow this general approach? I've been kind of, I've been taught this framework since my first year of university. Essentially, the only new thing here is computational. That's <laughs> really essentially. But governance generally has followed this evolution in Western countries in the main, right? That you're hierarchical, then you're market driven, and then you become quasi market driven when you realize markets don't solve all problems, and you become networks because then you realize we all have to work together. Networks also fall into the language of joint up government. And then we have something that's really new around what computational governance looks like. Um, if you want to have an idea about like the impact of that, Hafton and I wrote like a really interesting chapter on like algorithmic governance, right? And what that means in society. It's a really good example in my mind of what computational governance looks like. Why do I care about governance? Well, it's for this reason. So I get this from David Eves. Uh, and he makes this argument that there are regions of the world that are creating an ideological understanding of what governance of these technologies should be centered on. 
essentially, where does the public value reside? Right, and I find this fascinating. And his argument is that, well, in America, the public value of these ICT technologies, and it leads into what the state is doing, is around how you increase the finances, and finances here is like external finances in the main, and how do you follow free market ideas? Not to say that America is just like a free market country. I mean, yes, but like, it's not that, but it's about what the logic of ICT development there and the constraints on it are, right? So when I constrain an organization um, after that turning point, I still constrain them with the logic of they still free market ideals in place. They are changing slightly. I think I disagree with David Hughes with the way that Congress is dealing with big tech, but they are talking about dealing with big tech. They're not legislating about how they're dealing with big tech. It's an important kind of differentiation there. Europe is really about, and this really comes from the history in Europe as well, the public interest and privacy really drives the agenda. Uh, you can see this most clearly with the AI, the EU's AI policy framework that should be coming out about this year at some point. Right? When you go to discussions about this, public interest and privacy are front and center of the thinking, if that makes sense. Whatever technologies come out, do whatever you need to do, but this is, this is the public value that we're going to manage and protect. Then he makes two interesting ones. I don't know if I agree with the China one so much. I think it's not great, but I don't know too much about China. But he makes the argument that in China, when it comes to this, it's still about party supremacy. Whatever you're doing, it's fine, but the party comes first. The hold of the party comes first. The power of the party comes first. The party creates the public good. You are here, which is nice, but we help create the public good. And he includes India, because India did something interesting last year on the G20 around creating digital public infrastructure and called it the India stack. And essentially said they're going to export this to the developing world. And his argument is that, well, India's approach is around inclusion and development. There's a lot of pushback on that, but I thought it was interesting about like inclusion and development being your governing principles. And then when you think about the African continent, the question that I ask is, what is ours? Not that the entire continent needs to have like one framework of thinking in any particular way, but like what is ours? And if we don't have our own, do we borrow from the others? All of these come from turning points at some point in history. Either they reverberate or the not reverberate, they repeat themselves over time or it's new things. So inclusion and development is a very new thing now, whereas public interest, privacy, party supremacy would have been the ideological vantage point of governance for these Europe and China over the last what, 60 years. So this is the last thing, second last thing I'll say. So I'm approaching this question by asking, well, what are the building blocks of re-engaging the conversation about digital governance? I have my own bias, but I'm curious to see what other countries say. And I think the only opportunity that we have, generally speaking, this, I might make it a pyramid. I don't like the pyramid because it like, has a sense of hierarchy built into it. I might draw this differently. But essentially, these are the pieces of the puzzle that all fit together to create like a digital space. Applications, digital platforms, datafication, visualization, cybersecurity, connectivity, physical infrastructure, DPI is digital public infrastructure, and then data exchange, right? People put emphasis on different aspects of this. And I think the greatest opportunity for the continent is those bottom three that I've highlighted in blue, right? Physical infrastructure is a must. You can't talk about this without building anything, right? But as you're building the physical infrastructure, is there a conversation about building digital public infrastructure as well? I used to call this government as a platform. I guess you're always told that's an outdated term now, so I'm changing it. But essentially, the two pieces, these three pieces, it's data exchange, digital IDs, and a common payment platform for all citizens. I put digital data exchange slightly differently because of how cross-cutting it is. But in general, data exchange, deep data exchange, for those who don't know, how does government communicate, how does government share data amongst itself? and with citizens and vice versa. So data exchange, DPI, physical infrastructure, I think are probably the most likely ones to kind of govern the way we think about governance going forward, because it opens up a brand new world of possibilities that we haven't seen yet, 
that the world is only thinking about. So I'm just going to go to the last gonna slide just because of time. So the way I'm going to do this is that I'm looking at two, five, eight, ten. Yeah, that's right. Ten countries, and I'm looking at so these all scored well on the UN's e-government digital index. I could be getting that D wrong. Right. So they all scored well on this. All of them generally have national ICT policies. Right. Generally speaking, I think there's one or two that I'm struggling to find, but all of them have either an ICT, national ICT strategy or a national ICT um, policy, but all of them have come out quite recently as well. So I'm not using our data to data. It's like what's currently happening in the thinking. And I want to do a kind of thematic analysis or documentary analysis of all of these policies to determine where they fit here. Where do these countries think they fit? And how do they approach this question? Do they talk about data exchange? Right now, from a quick glance, most African countries are generally thinking about physical infrastructure. There's a firm understanding that that's in place. Most people are talking about connectivity, right? And then everything else will follow based on like initial readings. The idea of applications is, or well, someone else will build the applications for us. We'll just get a private company to come do that, right? Cybersecurity, people say they talk about cybersecurity, but if you know what's happened in five different South African departments over like the last five years, you would think that government does not care about cybersecurity at all, right? So I want to figure out like, and I'm probably going to create an index of some sort. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know if I've got the energy to do it, but maybe for another paper to see how people score in their strategies around this. And I think that's what the paper is going to try and do. I might take out a few things. It's essentially over halfway down. It's like 60% done. And now I need to crunch the data. So maybe in like a couple of months time, I'll come back and tell you that it was all a lie. I was done. This didn't work. Or I'll come back and be like, this is really novel. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> It's so hot. <laughs> I'm sorry for this in the room. Yeah, it's very hot. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chikani. I think that was a fascinating presentation. Sounds like a super ambitious study. Um, and I'm probably going to cut out like half of it. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to, to seeing that. Um, and so I think really important questions put to us, first of all, about the way we're thinking about digital governance, public policy, and the digital uh, transformation, but then also these interesting ideas you have about some of these comparisons or ratings you want to do, uh, and perhaps there'll be some comments or questions about that. Uh, I want to encourage colleagues who are online to raise hands uh, when they would like to come in with any questions or put them on the chat, uh, but I'll start by looking around the room just to see what we've got, and so we'll start with Eugenio, and I'll keep on taking hands as they come. Please go ahead. Okay. Please introduce yourself for those who come. Uh, sabbatical is the relevant thing for me this year. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm to come to conferences, uh, but usually I'm based in the media department of this. And uh, I have seven questions, I will ask you one. <laughs> and uh, in a very instrumental way, because this is your chapter, and I'm also supposed to write a chapter for... You want to borrow from this chapter? And so I want to use this as an opportunity for a conversation, because yeah. we can measure similar things. So, so as I started rewriting my own chapter, rethinking my chapter, mm. which was supposedly on uh, comparative AI policy, artificial intelligence policy yeah. in Africa, I thought about kind of a schizophrenic approach of some African governments uh, that you also touched upon. You said, where is the global south? And let me two example. One is like Uganda or Ethiopia, internet shut down. Yeah. And, uh, and how someone like Museven is becoming increasingly vocal about is these are our right to be shut down because you guys are messing with our politics. Uh, mm -hmm. We got to take responsibility for it. Uh, and it's also in one of those conversations, there's an issue about taxation. You know, you make value in our own countries, but we don't get any benefits from it from a financial point of view. Yeah. So there is an assertiveness. Then uh, when it comes to Kenya, a great example, a recent one, is how workers of this company, Sama, that was outsourced by OpenAI and Facebook Meta to do content moderation of the most horrible kind of things, mm. started saying, we are not the sweatshop of the world. <laughs> so that because we're tired of CP heading, it's yeah. being mistreated and all this kind of stuff. And they went public big time saying, we're tired of how big tech mistreats us. So there's a whole movement around it. Mm. So in a way, there seems to be a pushback 
against the, the tyrotrope of, uh, you know, Africa follows, Africa keep quiet. Uh, but then, this is the skills of, when it comes to policy, there is this tendency of picking, copying, replicating, you know, you use the GDPR. And so yeah. it, it would be so, you know, these energies that are expended by governments, by, you know, people in the labor market to, to sort of assert Africa's right to do things Mm. I'm not picked up in policy in any ways. And to finish uh, connecting to your to your pyramid, uh, I made a similar point about that exchange. It was in Rwanda, and I had there was a minister of ICTs in Rwanda and said, Are you guys exchanging data between yourselves? Yeah. Not at all. And it would be powerful. And, and, and going back to I say our colleagues are both advisor now, <laughs> Shilin Ben's point yes. on the, the petty situation of the nation state in Africa. And how Pan-Africanism that used to be one of the the, 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 the driving forces and ideology is completely lost. So if Rwanda, Ethiopia and Uganda could start trusting each other and sharing information, uh, the data that they collect, that mm -hmm. there would be a very powerful message to the rest of the world. But they don't. Mm -hmm. And if they will, it's probably an hate thing. You know, the academics are trying to push it, but the government's saying no. So how do you make sense of this, you know, it's schizophrenia, it's like why it seems to be energy that can be used and turn into policy. They don't walk the talk. Mm -hmm. They talk aggressively. There are different forces that are talking, but the policy is just completely silent to all of it. And, you know, it's naive to think that policies could do some of that work because right now it adopt. Yeah. So maybe underpinning that is a question. So do the policy policies actually matter? Those documents that you're analyzing. I think, yeah. Look at that. It's so good. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you want to take that first? I don't see any hands yet. Oh, there is. Do you want to take more than one at a time? Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. We'll do that. So let's take three in the room, and then we'll come online. So online, get ready with your questions. So. Um, it's a question <laughs> There's something I've noticed because I'm also thinking of my <laughs> Looking at um, digital transformation within Africa and trying to find a theme like what you see like in Europe where it's a, a public interest the first time time, it's quite difficult because because we're so divided on the continent and we focus on different things and each area has different issues that they deal with. It's quite hard to find one continental theme. And I think that's where we get the mimicking that comes from those who are currently practicing digital transformation um, and digital governance. That's the one observation from my side. The second thing, um, we got to the bubble, the bubble issue. I don't think it, I don't necessarily think there'll be a bubble burst like with the Ubers and the Airbnb because it's not necessarily a product being sold to the public. It's more for the public being owned by the government. So it might be more cycles of improvement, but I don't think it will be bubbles. It will just look differently in the future. And introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Sarah Dupay. I'm <laughs> program coordinator Great, thank you. If there are no other questions in the room, I'll, I'll load mine on. And mine are going to be very, like, just almost, you can speak to them if you want to or not. <laughs> um, the one is, and maybe, I think it may relate to the last thing Sarah was just saying, is, is it the same thing to map a technology against Carlota Perez's cycle as to match a government's policy or approach to technology? So are they the same thing? Can you do it? I know you're trying to do it, but does it make sense to do it? And then the second question I wanted to ask is maybe just broadly the why or who kind of question. Um, so I have a conspiracy view, but I think it might actually be <laughs> that the reasons these policies and strategies all look the same is because they're all sponsored by the same champions who come from elsewhere. So I don't think most of our governments invest much of their time or money to develop these documents and either because we don't think they matter or because we don't think we need them or because somebody offered and actually I think there are a lot of offers 
uh, that come mainly from people around the Atlantic uh, to develop these documents. Does that matter? And is there anything around the why, you know, some of these observations you have that that's, it may not feature in the paper, but that you're thinking about it? Or is it in a way just intellectualizing and it's better just to look at the facts? So just, just that, that's my broad question. Do you want to take that set? And then I'm going to encourage those who are online because we are short on time to start raising questions or putting onto the chat. Otherwise, we will... Uh, move towards closure after this round if I don't see more hands. Please. Yeah, so I'll be very quick and I'll move backwards and end with Eugenio. So yeah, it's a huge concern about who's writing the documents, right? It's also a huge concern about who's designing the, the policy interventions themselves. What we do know is that generally every document that I've now read generally will always talk about there's a lack of capacity within the states. You have a few countries that will be like, no, we're fine. But generally speaking, there's a lack of capacity within the states. A nice example is that there is no, there's national, in South Africa, for those who are here, there's, there's national treasury. Um, there's national treasury, I think there's DPSA, DCDT, where I know there's dedicated software developers in those departments. Every other department just doesn't have that capacity let alone at a local government level, that all of that is procured elsewhere, essentially. Even the idea of what we want to do is procured elsewhere. So the RFI is not done in-house, the RFI is done by an outside company. RFI is like, what problem you want to solve? Give us information about it. The RFP is like what the tender is. We'll then find someone to solve this problem that someone has identified for us from outside the country. It's a huge challenge within the continent. I don't know how to solve it. For the framework, fully get that criticism, I am mapping the, adop the adoption of technology, right? So essentially, if I just go back here, what this framework, the way I interpret it is that government only kicks in at number three. Government is not the country, is not the producer of undersea cables. <laughs> you know what I mean? Government isn't the producer of the antennas that uh, connect networks together, like the cell phone towers. Government doesn't produce that. The private sector does that. That's the eruption. Government kicks in about that synergy. You guys messed up the sector in one way or another. How do we now regulate it? Do we do it ourselves? Because this is now a major public good. So railroads, we'll do this ourselves. Certain countries like we still trust that you can do this yourself. So, so what I'm mapping is the, ado the adoption of technology. What I do know is that certain countries are not waiting for three. Right. There are certain ICT strategies that are really talking about adopting and playing in that number two, whether it's AI, whether it is machine learning. We're now in that world. And I'm curious about whether everyone's on what side you are. And if you are at number two, what that turning point looks like. I have no idea. That is more me more like pontificating and thinking about what it might look like. Um, the country is very, very, the continent is heterogeneous. Everyone is very, very different. My response to that was then would be then, oh, I then would assume that everyone would have different policies. Right? Like the whole continent is fundamentally different. You would then assume everyone would have their own different policies. It comes back to that earlier point. Like, well, why is it the why is it the case that everyone has centered on this one place? It's very different from like the EU or the United States of America. The United States of America is extremely diverse more diverse than you would care to like know, but there's a nation state that holds it. EU is extremely diverse, but there's a regulatory body that holds it together. AU is a bit weak when it comes to doing that. But how have we managed to coordinate everyone to do the exact same thing when it comes to the types of policies and governance? At least that's the argument that I'm making. And then I don't know how to answer Eugenio's point, except to say I was at a conference with Nkokame last year with the African Development Bank. And the colleague from Botswana was like, I have been trying to get hold of the South African government. We have a platform that does public participation and public budgeting that is open source that we want to give the South African government. And all we need to do is work together and exchange data. And we can hit economies of scales with each other. But I can't get hold of them. It's a wild thing to say, <laughs> right? That your next door neighbor is right there saying, I want to help you. I'm here. I need your help to expand my products, 
right? Because you've got economies of scale that we just don't have here but you're not even picking up the phone. There's a huge problem there, and I think it is history. I think there's a nation state problem there, um, or the power of the nation state. But there's also beauty that was stuck in this fight between not working with each other, which African countries generally are not great at like that kind of working together, but also facing the pressure of like the world looking at us as like the last frontier, like a new toy to play with. You're not super rich, but if we get you and you become super rich in the future, then we're entrenched. Which is why Google then does the types of uh, public infrastructure it does when it comes to connectivity on the continent um, in one way or another. Uh, it's why you'll have Microsoft and Amazon and as a third party who all decided that we'll set up all our servers here and we'll get our data houses here in particular. There's this reimagining of like what the value of the continent looks like and people aren't really sure what it is but they are testing out different ideas because they know they don't have to take responsibility. And I think it's right for nation states to push back on that. But yeah, that's the best answer I can give to that for now. Because <laughs> yeah. is asserting this is a kind of an angry version of decolonization. Yeah. You, know, you can't mess up with our stuff. It's not an, an open magic. Like, no. I, I, I wrote a piece that, you know, I love the title of the video. It was where is Sankara? If Sankara was leading that, you know, it would have a different image. It would be you know, <laughs> anti imperialist, pro people, yeah. kind of person, not like a Chinese, you know, as it was there. And, and the question is, you know, your name and my name, we can't push that. But, you know, there are people like, again, a show who has a platform for saying mm -hmm. that this seems to be academia, certainly in South Africa, less so in other places. It is sort of trying to propose a less angry and more rigid decolonization that at the end of the day is in the interest of, uh, of the citizen or the users, it depends on how you picture it. Mm -hmm. It's naive to think that that kind of pushback uh, or reimagination is less or not. You know, so, Kagame doesn't read Mbembe, but who do you listen to? You know, Mbembe, is, there are more people saying the same thing. And this is African mm -hmm. thinkers which is zero. There are synergies, it's just less angry. Yeah, no, I get you on that. I mean, I, I don't know, in a slightly, I don't know, time is going to start defeating us. I mean, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the podcast. For those who don't know, I've got a podcast coming out soon. Mm -hmm. But the conversation I was having with Kristen Abrahams about the influence of social media platforms on elections, but particularly in South Africa when it comes to um, monitoring like bad things, hate speech, violence, all that jazz. And one of the things we kind of came to the conclusion of, regardless of like what we say in anger to big tech, whether it's the president, whether it's citizens, what we do know now is that big tech just doesn't care about us. Like it, it's like a legit thing of, yeah, but like you don't make us that much money. Like we're here out of the benevolence of our hearts. Now you're throwing stones at us. And that type of relationship means that there's very few ways to get their attention, right? And even when you get their attention, is it like you've got my attention or is it like there's an annoying fly that's flying around? And those relationships, so when you, and that, sorry, I'm now bringing back to like decolonial thoughts in particular. When you think about decolonial thought, decolonial thought is generally a two-way relationship. Right, it's one activity of someone advocating for liberation or change, and the reaction by the oppressor to that change that then forms the relationship between the two. Right, and you need that oppressor to at least see you. If they never ever see you, then the only option you have is them to raise up arms. And I think the problem that we're having now is that big tech just doesn't see the continent as valuable in the sense of our bottom line would be truly effective. And that ambivalence, ambivalence is the word I would use, that ambivalence creates challenges around how we interact with them. Um, so Tristan, again, they went to TikTok being like, TikTok, you really should get better. And TikTok just said, now nah, we're good. <laughs> like, we're not going to talk to you guys. It's the legal resources center. We're just not going to talk to you guys. X was like really, really interested. And then they've gone completely zero dark 30 on them, right, with the elections around the corner. And this is them showcasing their data collection of hate speech being of the 15 Abbots 
that were put out that were overtly xenophobic, overtly xenophobic, advocating violence. All 15 were approved on their advertising platforms, Facebook, X, TikTok, and YouTube in South Africa in multiple different languages. It's wild, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> No, thank you. And actually, I think that's all we'll have time for. So I think there's an excellent suggestion there for your podcast. You can interview him. <laughs> uh, he should be at wiser with you. So <laughs> I think that would be an interesting interview. Uh, I think what it does make me wonder, though, because as you're saying that, Eugenia, I was just thinking that... Um, so, so is, is the issue that our intellectuals aren't speaking into the policy space? But then I began to wonder whether the policy space itself is a problem. And you began by saying that there's an over-focus on that. And I think one of the consequences of that, and you also you know, early on mentioned this critique of uh, Paia and the way it mim mimics something else, that I do think public policy is almost it's a thing onto itself and I think has its own gold standards of what's yes. a good one. And when a country has a legacy of, or, or I would call it a burden of your fantastic constitution, you know? And so now every other government <laughs> also be fantastic just like the constitution. And the problem with that is maybe one of the reasons why it doesn't reflect practice, um, but also, you know, what is the willingness, even if we believed we could reimagine or decolonize, of policymakers to actually put that into a document and say, and this is our policy on digital that completely does not look like anywhere else, and maybe does not mention the word democratize, and maybe does not. <laughs> And basically says it will shut you down if you don't like what we do. Decision and digital policy, you know, and then I mean that is that is my goal in life in general. How? <laughs> but we will look forward to your podcast with Ashil Mbembe. We look forward to your mapping to see whether it's possible to actually see whether these uh, how many countries, your ten countries, uh, are looking different, and if. Uh, not then why are we seeing policy circulation? Uh, I think it sounds like a fascinating chapter. Thank you for your time. So I think we're actually over time uh, and, and we've already done the updates at the beginning. Uh, our next uh, dialogue is going to be on the 7th of March. So it's not very far because we delayed this one by a week. So the 7th of March, we'll be having our next lunchbox. There'll be information coming around. Again, if you'd like to be on the roster for the course of the year, please don't hesitate to let Zibusiso know. Uh, we are going to be trying to plan these a little bit more ahead than usual. So you want to get on the list uh, if you hope to join us. Thanks to the colleagues online who joined us. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rosibose.